Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Julie Dulaterre. She holds an MS from the Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Mad- Wisconsin-Madison. She's been an activist since she was a child, helping her mother care for injured wildlife. She lives on a small farm in southwest Wisconsin where she grows most of her food and teaches others the art of self-reliance. She's a member of Save Our Unique Lands, an NGO that opposes massive power line expansion infrastructure. She owns Ethos Restoration Landscapes, a chemical-free native plant and, po- and food polycultural landscaping business which emphasizes removing lawns and restoring native plants, which is always a good idea. That's E-T-H-O-S-R-L dot com. As an environmental consultant, she is engaged in a food sovereignty movement with the Ho-Chunk Nation and leads foraging walks. She hopes to launch a multifaceted deep green immersion project with the tribe that will explore the natural world from earth to sky through various pedagogical methods and an in-place polycultural green space. She organized and facilitated a 33-day long trans-state walk in 2016 in Wisconsin to unpack the dangers of the four-pipe Enbridge Pipeline Corridor and oppose any expansion of same. She is recently in partnership with Earth Law Center to initiate the Great Lakes Rights of Nature Coalition, working with concerned people all around the Great Lakes ecosystem to enact legal structures that take rights away from corporations and acknowledge the rights of the lakes to exist, persist, and flourish, which is what we'll be talking about today. She travels the country giving talks on various subjects and this last weekend presented at the Democracy Convention in Minneapolis, Minnesota about institutionalized violence, its effects on humans and the natural world and how to address it. She believes that transformation begins in hearts and minds and expands to all living systems and that we need to replace warmongering messaging, iconography, education, etc. with the narrative of acknowledging the intrinsic rights of all living systems. She maintains her bog called Sacred Water, Sacred Land, her blog, sorry, about the sacredness of all things. It's called Sacred Water, Sacred Land. So first off, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Thanks, Derek. Great to be here. So thanks. Today, let's talk about this uh, this partnership with the Earth Law Center to initiate the Great Lakes Rights of Nature Coalition. So before we do that, though, let's talk about the Great Lakes. People may have heard of them, but I don't know if a lot of people recognize the trouble they're in. So actually, can you back up? Can you talk about how amazing and wonderful the Great Lakes are and then talk about the threats to them and then talk about how they aren't currently? Okay, well, the first thing to to realize is the Great Lakes hold over 20% of the world's fresh water supply, which is absolutely amazing when you think about it. So they are a global issue. The health of them, the maintenance of them, the um, making sure the water stays there is really, really important. Um, there's a huge amount of culture that surrounds the Great Lakes. 157 tribes uh, share the uh, all the land around the Great Lakes, plus all the communities and all the people and all the stories and all the history that have to do with those lakes. Uh, the lakes have been threatened for quite a long time, uh, beginning with colonization, of course, when they started using it for trade. And then the cities started growing up along the edges and dumping their sewage in them. And then in Lake Huron, there's a nuclear power plant. There's heavy water in Lake Huron now. Uh, in Lake Superior, there's a whole bunch of barrels, like 200 of them toxic waste that the Army Corps of Engineers just threw in the middle of the lake, and the tribes have been trying to extricate them. Of course, the lakes are also the recipients of surface water nutrient pollution coming off of agricultural areas and now having dead zones and having um, – Bloom, and then everybody remembers Lake Erie and all their problems in the 70s before all the environmental acts, which now Trump is destroying, came into being. And Lake Erie is going back to being, well, the people on Lake Erie are uh, trying to keep it from going back to where it was before. There's actually a group of people in Toledo, Ohio, that have drawn up the Bill of Rights of Lake Erie, and they're working with Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund on that. I got to peek a little bit at that. So that's a whole group protecting one of the lakes. So that's really cool. And what was the third thing I was supposed to comment on? Um, before we get to the third thing, let's, let's, I'm just, do we know, like I know that prior to colonization here, the, uh, you can read accounts of early European explorers who talked about salmon so thick on the Klamath that it was, the entire river was black and roiling, they said. So do we, know anything do we have any accounts of uh like how many fish were in the great lakes was it was it the same sort of amazing at this point almost unbelievable fecundity oh derek i'm sure that's the way it was i mean lots of people made their livings just fishing the great lakes and they're still 
countless people doing that, but the fish stocks are declining just like they were, are everywhere else in the world. But, you know, that that's really what's happening. We've got a shifting baseline. So what we think is might be an abundant event now is maybe one thousandth of what it should have been. And that's all because of uh, global capitalism and the society that we live in. Everything is treated like a commodity. So obviously uh, we're not thinking about it long term. So does and, and also I presume that because it's I mean they're they're lakes I presume that um, it's incredibly important to all sorts of waterfowl is that is that the case? Uh, the sloughs and the backwaters of these uh, huge lakes are where you're going to find the waterfowl, but of course it's all connected. And as they develop the edges of these lakes and destroy those areas where the water would pool and be cleansed before it entered the lakes, of course that's going to compromise the lakes. So you would you would assume any kind of, uh, they call it development, but any kind of urban destruction along the edges is going to destroy that, and of course it's going to destroy the uh, habitat for the waterfowl. So the third part was the, um, the first part was what was it like before, the second part was um what is it what what are the, what is the current state of the great lakes and the third part was what are some of the primary threats to the great lakes ah so there there we go um some are saying that uh fresh water is going to be the new gold nestle's already in the lakes i think they're primarily in lake superior with their ships drawing out water there's a law that they can only uh they can't package it in a certain uh, size, so then what they did is they just put it in a different size container. So Nestle's already in there taking out the water. And, of course, there's a – I can't remember which city here in Wisconsin has now gotten the go-ahead, the green light, to take water directly out of Lake Michigan, and that's never been allowed before because there was the Great Lakes Compact, where which didn't let any entity draw water out of the lake. So you know, maybe we're going to end up with the Great Lakes Water Wars or something, but – um, I guess I could speak for a lot of people. We're concerned that we we don't want it to get that bad, and we don't want it to be a big conflict, and we want to keep that water in place because that's all part of our uh, regional ecosystem. Just like anything else, when you deplete one part of it, you're going to deplete, deplete the whole thing. So there's the taking of the water. There's um, oh, I'm trying to think. There's a, a whole bunch of invasive species that have gotten into the lakes. Of course, that's when. People come in with boats from overseas, and they let the bilge water out, and then pretty soon, you, you know, you, everybody's heard about the zebra mussels clogging up all the pipes. And uh, there's uh, the sea lamprey. Uh, there's a couple other fish that aren't supposed to be in there. Uh, I can't list off all the invasive species, but it's certainly an issue in the lakes, just like it is in a lot of other lakes in the Midwest. Um, so... Then, of course, using the water for uh, manufacturing, a lot of companies will go on the edge of these lakes because they can just take all the water they want, and then they can just kind of let their poisons just leak into the lake, and who's going to know? And I know that's happening, so there's that. Um, I don't know. The list could go on forever, really. And so let's let's move to the current campaign, and... You talked about Great Lakes Rights of Nature Coalition, and and what, what, what is the foundation for that? What is what does all that mean? Okay, um, way back in two thousand and five, after they passed the UN uh, Declaration of Universal Human Rights, after that they passed in two thousand and five. The Declaration for the Universal Rights, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, of all living things, and out of that came the Rights of Nature Movement, as I understand it, and several different organizations were formed at that point. Um, the one that I became the most familiar with is the Citizens Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and their organization is the one that was um, involved in the uh, Ecuadorian Amendment to their Constitution, Rights of Nature uh, Amendment, and then Bolivia, and then... Um, uh, what's that other country? Was it New Zealand? Anyway, they've been all over the world. So I went to a couple of democracy schools and learned about how our Supreme Court has ruled many, many times in favor of corporations and not in favor of all living things. And once a person begins to know that, you realize we don't really live in a democracy and we don't live in a system that's going to actually preserve anything for the next seven generations. And that's only if you're concerned about human beings. I'm concerned about all living things, not just human beings. But anyway, um, 
that these legal structures that are written by these specialist lawyers that are uh, schooled in this have been enacted in uh, ordinances that have been enacted in over 150 places in the U.S. so far. And now there's a river out in Oregon, is it the St Stiglitz River is going to court on behalf of itself, and that was just within the last couple of weeks. So it's gaining momentum. Essentially, it's just legal language saying that the uh, natural, I shouldn't say natural entities, these non-humans have standing in court. Of course, a human will have to speak on their behalf, but they have standing in court. So what I did is got a hold of the Earth Law Center and asked if they would like to enter in a partnership with Sacred Water, Sacred Land to try to protect the Great Lakes. And so we've been at it for a couple of months now, and it's kind of slow going. Um, not everybody, probably 95% of the population may not realize how little constitutional protections they have and nature has uh, under our current system. So um, maybe you can ask me a little bit more specific question about how it works or something. Oh, sure. Um, so how, well, let's, what, let's, let's back up a little bit. What do you mean by a natural right for a non-human being? Are you, so what, what rights are you asserting that um, a lake has? A lake has a right to exist, persist, and flourish in all of its natural cycles and, and systems. That's how they would say it in the language. And, I mean, it, it just, it's, it seems absurd to me that we even have to make the argument that um, the Great Lakes have the right to exist. Um, but You're exactly right, Derek. We shouldn't have to do this, but we're in throes of... Uh, uh, unfettered global exploitative capitalism and patriarchy, which gives absolutely no rights to anything other than white rich men who pull the strings on everything. So yeah, we shouldn't have to have these laws at all. It's 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 insane. And it's it's also insane that that um, you know corporations, as as you and I both know, corporations have have rights, are, are granted rights, I should say, and um, and. Uh, organization, so, so organizations of these these rich men have rights, uh, whereas the real physical world doesn't. That's 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 a that's always been a quite extraordinary thought for me. Yeah, it's really extraordinary considering the fact that they wouldn't be here if they didn't have a natural system to live in. So it's like they're completely ignoring ignoring their origins, which is a, a perfect symptom of, of runaway patriarchy, because you're not going to acknowledge anything other than your own narcissistic, psychopathic desires. You know, that's what it is. So, so when you, let's, let's start to move. So first off, let's talk about the, uh, the nature coalition. So is this, you mentioned a group in Toledo, you mentioned CELDF. Um, how how many states are involved? How many how many groups are in how many states associated with this? And first off, how many states are around the Great Lakes? I'm sorry for my ignorance. And then, how many states do you have people in? <laughs> hey, you know what? You're making me bone up on it. Um, I'm thinking that's nine states, and I'm thinking it's like four Canadian provinces. But I might be wrong. There might be more. And I, I guess I better sit and look at a map. So next time somebody asks me, I can really be sure of my answer. I do know it's over 1,500 communities and 157 tribes, and I don't know how many nonprofits or community organizations. And to answer your the first question, we're just very new. So far we've got the Organic Consumers Association to come on board. I mean, that's kind of a, a no-brainer. And then uh, uh, Grant Wilson with Earth Law Center was talking to somebody today from some religious group, but he didn't give me all that information. So, like, the different players in the coalition, him and I and other people associated with him, we're trying to reach out to people that we think might be interested in engaging and eventually enacting these legal structures in their communities. So um, we're, this hopefully this interview with you will make it more visible and maybe more people will come on board. But, yeah, it's it's not an easy task. It's not like there's a whole bunch of people out there ready for this information and then trying to explain to them what it really means and how engaging it is, is actually going to accomplish anything because 
so many people are like, oh, that's just another thing coming down the pike. It's not going to accomplish anything. Why waste my time, you know, and trying to get them excited about, okay, this is something that actually works. Uh, uh, things have got, I mean, a river in Ecuador, the Vilcabama River, one in court, and you got to, like, tell them and get them to, like, realize there's a whole different way of looking at legal structures and, and, and our society. I mean, it's almost like you got to kind of, turn their whole reality upside down or something. So it's not just a campaign about what law can do. It's a, cam- a campaign about what they can do. It's a campaign about how they're connected with their nature. It's a campaign about, you know, thinking about the next generations. It's a campaign about interconnectivity. There's so many layers of significance that I feel like the campaign's more useful in, in the campaign itself than the actual legal structure at the end of it. Because you're having all this dialogue in between. So, this this might not be a fair question, but if it's if it's not fair, then we'll just move on. Um, uh, give give me the argument, the strongest argument you can against having the Great Lakes. What what's the argument that would be used by by the other side to attempt to discredit you? The, the, um, why should why should the Great would... Lakes not have rights? Because it, depending on, well, any group that would argue it would be one that would be standing to uh, make money somehow off of the lakes not having this protection, I would think it would be some sort of corporate entity, and they would say, well, it's interfering with commerce, which is the one, the commerce clause is the one they always bring out to fight anything that takes away their profit. And you know as well as I do is all corporations go in the court and say, look, look, they took away our profit. They didn't let us do that thing, and now we can't make a 18 gazillion dollars. Well, now you got to pay us the money that we would have made if you hadn't have stopped us. So that would probably be the most important argument. Um, that's why all these other campaigns have to happen in the meantime, which is maybe we need to look at economic progress differently and have the um, a progress indicator that's not based on um, the commodification of all of our reality and more on, you know, how well are we doing and how healthy is our environment. So, like, there's a whole other layer to this. So the people that stand to gain money from exploiting the lakes are going to fight it saying you're cutting into our profits. That would probably be the most visible argument. And they will also say that uh, look at all the jobs that we're bringing in, and so basically you want all these families to starve. Right, so like being part of the corporate monetary commodification system is our first enslavement, isn't it? So until we can walk away from that enslavement, they're always going to use that argument. Which is one reason that you also work on food sovereignty issues, I believe. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, taking care of yourself is your first step towards independence, if if not the most important step. So walk me through step by step what you... If, if this campaign to to gain rights of nature for the Great Lakes, um, walk me through a a more or less um, not ideal but a a fairly positive, realistic estimate of how you would like the campaign to go over the next year or two. What what are you hoping to accomplish in the short run, and what do you need to accomplish that? Well, um, that's that's a good question, and. Uh... I guess I'll, I'll quote what I learned from uh, a, new, a new colleague of mine. His name is uh, Hank Ovink, and he's from the Netherlands, and he's the United Nations' first world water ambassador. And I had him on the phone last week because I just wanted to know what works, what works in big, big projects because he's done some big ones. Like he came in after Hurricane Sandy and tried to get everybody to figure out what to do about rising sea levels. And his, his first piece of advice to me was to make the lakes the conversation. So, so I would take him up on that, and I would make the lakes the conversation. And then he said the second thing is to get every school around the lakes to have a lake immersion experience so they understand the importance of the lakes and why they need to be protected. I shouldn't say, you know, sometimes i got to pay attention to my narrative. To protect them means that I'm better than them. So, like, that the lakes need to be acknowledged for, for the intrinsic value that they have by humans, because they all, they've all they always had value. It's not up to us to say whether some, something's value or not. So, so to get people to realize how they fit into the universe, that it's not all about human beings, 
that our children realize the value of having clean, fresh water in order to survive on this, in climate chaos and that the lakes become like part and parcel of people's understanding of who they are in the in in the space that they inhabit. And indigenous people do that through stories. So I thought, well, maybe we should come up with some lake stories or something or ask for people to tell stories about the relationship with the lake because before writing and modern times, everything was by word of mouth and it was person to person, story to story. And that's how we learn for most of human existence. So I'd like to see that come out somehow. And how, um, let's, let's talk about the school thing for a minute. How would, how would one go about what sort of immersion, uh, would you like to see from individual, uh, schools and teachers for, for their students? And, and what would be the steps required I mean, say somebody is hearing this and they live in, uh, I don't know, UP, M Michigan, and uh, what would what would you want them to do, and 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 how, and what would you want the school program to look like? Wow, we're fitting a lot into forty five minutes. Okay, so um, Earth Law Center came up with this little thing where they bottle an ecosystem and the kids do this thing and they make their own little enclosed ecosystem and then they figure out well, how to protect it as a way to think about legal structures to protect the natural system. My idea would be go out to some body of water if you're too far away from the lake, uh, an inland lake or some type of lake or river even or something, and the kid would pick out you know their little piece of it and then they would be in it, and they would describe it, and they would observe it, and then they would talk about what it, its intrinsic rights, um, which is really hard because we're talking about narratives that aren't normalized in our culture. So the teacher would have to spend some time adjusting their pedagogy in class from one of treating all natural systems as objects to one as subjects and getting the kids to understand that that they're part of their ecosystem, and that would be maybe a whole new way of actually talking to their students. So that might have to be the first layer is is getting the, them into that headspace, and then to enter in relationship with their little ecosystem, wherever that may be. It could even just be a single plant, but teaching by example and through story and narrative that we are all in relationship with with the entire planet and with all ecosystems. That's not what we're taught. So it would be kind of challenging for your average teacher to do this perhaps, especially if they have certain programs that they have to do in schools. So um, maybe it would have to be a program that would be an extracurricular program put on by a nonprofit where they would invite the students to come so the burden wouldn't be on the teachers to actually have to develop it. So I'm sorry I don't have a more fleshed out answer to that. I haven't written any curriculums yet. It's just I'm just talking about what we would be trying to accomplish and how how that might look. Well, I I remember specifically from um, fourth grade we we in, at my elementary school went to a farm that was right next door to the school. And, um, we were given a tour of their barn so that we could see the barn owls and see all the, you know, when owls eat the mice and then they, they vomit up the, uh, little mouse pellet. Um, yeah. so we were shown those and my point is that that is one of the few days I still remember from fourth grade and wow. that is it doesn't so so i i think that these larger projects would be really great but i think just simply getting children out of the classroom and as you said into you know some slough or into and i i remember another day in about that same time when my friend and i went for a long 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 walk and we came across this pond we'd never seen before it was all full of frogs, and the point is, I oh, the, right. the, the point is, I still remember that day. I can still remember the the pond. Unfortunately, it was also full of. It was on a farm, and so it was all full of uh, like garbage from the farm. You know, the old tractors or whatever. But I still remember seeing the frogs just all over the pond, and I think 
at the very least, it's helpful to help children to gain those memories. Yeah, I think it's almost violent to not allow them to have them. Because look at how significant that was for you. And I, I'd have to say, Derek, I, ha I share the same sort of memories because um, all the running around I did with my brothers and my sister and the, the deep memories were out in nature, whether we're just walking down the road or finding monarchs in the ditch or going down to the quarry or a pond or whatever. Those are very vivid memories for me. I remember walking down the road and there, there was countless, I call them monarch plants, not milkweeds because I don't like the word weed, and there was thousands, hundreds of thousands of monarchs everywhere. There's so much abundance. It's really sad that we've lost 50% of all of our animals in my lifetime. And then I was reading the other day, 60% of the insects. This is craziness. This is nuts. This plant was so abundant and so amazing and so beautiful. And what do we get? We're trying to McDonaldize everything. All we have left is like an industrialized, burned out landscape with like five species of trees or something. And that's supposed to like feed our soul, you know, it's insane. So we've, we've, we've talked briefly, I agree with you, we've talked briefly about what schools might do, what, what do you want, how else are you going to build this coalition, who else are you going to reach out to, you mentioned a religious organization, um, so just talk to me more about building this coalition, and, and what you would hope All to right, happen. Well, the, the first layer would be to, to reach out to everybody that says Great Lakes something or other, <laughs> which is what I've been doing, and then reaching out to the tribes, which is a whole different ball game altogether because I'm not Native, I'm a white woman, and, of course, you know, they have a certain uh, understanding of what us white, colonizer, white colonizers think and do, so um, I have to probably mediate my message through um, some Native person. I, I think we might have a young Native woman on board who might mediate that message to the to the Native community um, because they're not going to, probably not going to give me the time of day. Um, but that's okay. We do it how we do it. And then uh, probably put on some events uh, and see who comes. But it's early. We haven't written any, well, there's a possible grant, but right now I put in two months of volunteer work. I'm not paid for any of this. So um, it'd be nice to actually have somebody pay for my gas when I'm running around but often that's the case. The people that are doing the really, really important work, it's not the work of exploitation. It's the work of all living things. And there's not a lot of uh, monetary uh, gain to that. There's just the gain of knowing that you're doing something good uh, that will hopefully live beyond yourself. So, it, like I said, it's early. We're trying to reach out. I'm trying to go, me personally, I'm trying to go to conventions or reach out to people and network the two lawyers, um, Grant Wilson and Art Helmus, are doing their own thing. They're all the way across on the other side of the country. I've never met them. They're out in California. So we speak on the phone once a week. We have a, um, an online uh, conversation where people can check in and talk to each other via text. And we put that together. And so far, nobody's really taken off with that. So um, some of the the difficulties with this sort of campaign is just communication because it's it's a huge area and it's a huge concept and like uh einstein said it takes a great mind to take a a complex idea and make it so that anybody can understand it and i think right now we're struggling with that what does that look like so we're trying to roll out a logo and a tagline something that catches people and i hate to say it but i mean we almost need to use um market marketing uh techniques because that's what people are accustomed to Saul Alisky says use what the people are familiar with so we want to roll out some sort of campaign that way and so I can't really tell you it's it's early you caught us early on um and um I'm hoping it uh takes hold and, and builds exponentially because we really don't have a long time to do this I mean the Paris climate talks last year said we had uh two decades to make some progress with this mess we've made of this planet. So every morning I wake up, I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I better better keep going on this. Don't let it go. Work on it every day. And so, I'm one of millions of people thinking this, I'm sure. So something I often do with my writing is if I'm trying to figure out what to say in some paragraph or 
sentence even or page, whatever, is to just stop and then say, okay, what am I really trying to say? And forget rhetoric. So just pretend you and I are having a private conversation and mm -hmm. just tell me what's, what's the point? What do you really want to hope to accomplish? How do you, what do you want with this Great Lakes campaign? Do you want, I mean, what, if I were to say what I want for the salmon, it's very clear. I want for there to be more wild salmon every year than the year before. And I want for there mm -hmm. to be, so what do you want? What do you want to see? What's the, what's the real, the real bottom line? And, and just don't, don't be rhetorical. Just say, say whatever comes to head. Well, that they fall in love with themselves, their community, and the planet. That's what it is. And what do you want? What? Okay, I love that. That's great. And then what do you want for the Great Lakes? That they are able to exist, persist, and flourish without being degraded anymore and perhaps even made healthier. So. And so what? What? what would that look like? And I'm going to come back to people in a second. What would that look like for for the Great Lakes to be to be actually recovering and healthier? I mean, I know for the Klamath River, well, what it would look like is more water flowing through the river, fewer dams, more salmon, more lampreys, less algae, less ick, I C H. That's a it's a fungus. Um, so, what what would it look like for the Great Lakes to be healthier? Well, kind of what you said, a greater fish abundance, uh, less disease on the fish, less algae bloom, less persistent toxins, no more dumping of waste, no more influx of invasive species, no more messing about in the lakes like there's some kind of test tube, like you know how it is when they get an invasive species and they're going to bring in another one and then another one and then another one. It's just like one big, long, continuous science experiment. But I think probably the most significant part would be people having um, a spiritual relationship with the water and they'll understand that the water in their bodies is the same as the water in that lake. And, and so, like, so, like, there's this whole understanding that that lake is as precious as anything out there. And so, so there's, like, almost this, like, uh, energetic relationship between the people and the water. And I've experienced that up on Lake Superior, on the edge of Lake Superior. I was just sitting there uh, meditating, and this piece of driftwood started talking to me. I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. This is cool. So I, I remember that experience. And, and that's that's the kind of experience people should be having. That, that is the meaning of being a human on this planet, all these layers of understanding. So um, let's go back to... to to people for a second. And when you raise this issue, um, when you, when you start talking about the, the Great Lakes having rights and talk about them, them flourishing, what is the response by the environmentalists you talk to? And what is the response by the sort of regular people you talk to? Is it, is, are people open to this idea? And, and also, either before or after you do that, you said that one of the concerns that people might have is, oh gosh, this won't accomplish anything. And the answer to that, and, well, and the second thing is I want, to, I want you to answer that concern. So you can answer those in any order you want. What is the response okay, by a lot of people? And also... I'll try, to re I'll try to remember the second one after I answer the first one. I'll try too. <laughs> So I was just at this democracy convention, and there was a bunch of move to amend people there. And I tried to have a dialogue with them about the rights of nature laws, enacting rights of nature laws. They're very focused on changing the Constitution because they feel like that's how to answer it. So I guess one, one way of looking at it is, is people still have a lot of confidence in our existing legal structures, our Constitution, what presumably is supposed to be... Uh, representing everyone, all, all the humans, of course, not not the not the non-human world, but um, there's still a lot of faith in in changing that to reflect the re a real society, a real egalitarian society. And I feel like, and and rights of nature people feel too, is that we can't wait for these legal structures like the Constitution to have all the corporate rights removed from them before we move forward. 
We need to just assert the rights no matter what the Constitution says. So I guess the biggest difficulty for me talking about this is so many people still have faith in the existing Constitution that if we just tweak that, somehow everything's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay because the Constitution was written by white male property owners. It was never written for any of us. Or the natural, or the non-human world. I'm trying not to use the word natural. Or the non-human world. It wasn't written for us, so uh, it's hard to get people past that, right? That's the biggest difficulty. And then when they say, "Well, uh, some of the feedback I got is okay," so you pass it, you write the administrative rules because you can pass a law, but then you got to write administrative rules. And then how do you enforce it? What if a corporation says we're going to go ahead and uh, dig that high capacity well whether you like it or not and we don't care about your rights and nature laws so their question is who's going to enforce the law well that's another question isn't it you almost have to have your local sheriff on board on your side standing up for the community law or the community rights law and these battles are being fought out right now there's one in, i can't remember the community in pennsylvania where they the community passed a law that said it was okay for people to um, engage in civil disobedience on behalf of their health and the health of their ecosystem, and the corporation is challenging people's rights to actually say anything. So the corporations are trying to destroy free speech for the community where they're trying to dump fracking wastewater. So essentially they're saying all the people and all the non-humans, where they're, where they're dumping this frack water, they're all disposable. Henry Giroux likes to use that term, the culture of disposability. So um, the corporations on steroids treat all of us as disposable beings, whether we're humans or non-humans. We're not part of their algorithm. So uh, the challenge is to get people to realize current laws will not be protecting you and trying to play the game the way that it was written is not going to get the job done either. And it seems to me, I, I know Thomas Lindsay has said this to me many times, that one of the things that he does, is doing with his work, is you know giving people the tools of democracy, and then if they work, that's great, and if, if the corporations and the government comes and stomps on them, he has made clear the contradiction that we believe we live in a democracy when we don't. And it seems right. to me... That, and it seems to me this is one of the things you're saying too, is that if you present this, it's very reasonable to expect the people in the Great Lakes to want for the Great Lakes to be healthy and to flourish. It seems mm -hmm. that you can't really, you, you, you take the moral high ground there. And it's great, you know, if you present this and then if the corporations come and argue, no, the Great Lakes don't have the right, or if the government argues, no, the Great Lakes don't have the right to flourish. That seems, yes, that's an overt power play, and they, they may win in court, but it seems that's just a, a dreadful PR nightmare for them. I mean, it seems you that's a great, as you said earlier, a great way to raise awareness about the health of the Great Lakes. Right, and like you said, what Thomas Lindsay says, it's that, um, that dichotomy in what we think we have in the way of rights and what, when it comes right down to a lawsuit, we realize we don't. And so it's, it's that dichotomy that he's playing on. But unfortunately, people don't realize that until they've ended up in the courts, and that takes, what, three, four years? And by that time, some egregious thing might have been happening in this precious space that they were very concerned about. And, and one, a lot of this damage, once it's done, like, Injecting frack water into, into a deep well, you've contaminated an entire aquifer. Do we have three or four years to, like, adjudicate and look for damages? You can't return that aquifer back to the way it was before, ever. And so that that's kind of the, the difficulty. Well, not the difficulty, but that's the space of opportunity trying to get people to realize you don't want to go there. We don't want to let that happen. So I live in uh, southwestern Wisconsin on top of Karst, and we have beautiful water here. And my concern is we need to have protections here so that somebody doesn't swoop in and start taking our water just like they do other, other places. And I don't want to wait till they're doing it before anybody does something about it. But unfortunately, that's the way a lot of these situations go is the damage is already done. 
So when you go, when you, that's a, that's a really good point. When you go to something like a democracy convention or you go to speak to other people, do you, uh, how much do you run into a problem of, um, what I call human supremacism, where people think that the entire world was created for humans and basically screw the Great Lakes if, 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 if we can, or screw the aquifer, screw any of that, if, you know, if, if it's, if, if we can use it, there's, there's no, it's ridiculous that non-humans even have the right to exist. Is, is there, do you run into that very often or is that not a problem? Uh, it's typically not a problem in my circle, but I'm surrounded by a lot of conservative Christians where I live and yes, that, you got it, that's, where they're at, but, you know, I try to use stories and metaphor to talk to them, and uh, I would say something like, suppose your parents gave you a beautiful house that had everything you could ever want, it was it was just a luxury to live in, and you just took a jackhammer and a sledgehammer, and you smashed it to bits, and you burned it down, and then uh, what would your parents think about after they gave you that beautiful space to be? Is that respectful? Is that something you would do? And essentially, that's what we're doing. And on some level, they can understand that. So I don't run into it, like you said, because I don't run in those circles. But when I do talk to people, I try to make it really simple to them. And I've actually had some pretty good conversations with the Amish around me because they don't understand climate change. Of course, they don't watch media and they don't really spend a lot of time uh, engaged in studying scientific papers or listening to climate scientists, but they they see a lot of what's going on and they're interested in changing. Of course, they have families of 15 and 19 kids, which is like one of the major problems. I don't think I could ever talk them out of that. But, um, yeah, every audience is different. You know, I feel like, I feel like as the paradigm shifts and we start to think about how all things have intrinsic rights, and that includes women, children, elderly, uh, LGBT, whatever, blacks, natives, whatever. Um, it's all one big picture. Uh, seriously, it's, it's all one thing because it's whether we respect anything outside of ourselves. It's whether we have empathy or compassion for anything outside of ourselves. It could be a human or it could be a non-human. So I feel like we're just trying to shift a culture of extreme narcissism to one of compassion, empathy, and relationships. And so that's huge because this violent way of thinking is taught to children from a very young age, and lots of your interviews talk about such things, so you know what I'm talking about. So how do we shift that? So I feel like rights of nature campaigns anywhere can be part of shifting public consciousness to what I'm talking about, to one of love instead of hate. So, um, what do you, what, what you're saying makes a lot of sense and what, what, how, what sort of, let's, okay, let's say that the coalition has been formed and you've got a fairly large group of people around the the uh, this this question of rights for the Great Lakes and what would be the next sort of tangible steps that would be taken to uh, protect aquifers, for example, or to protect the lake itself? Would would then would then this be moved forward in a lawsuit fashion? Would this be how what, what would happen next? Do you know? Yes, um, I'm. I would, or I am imagining and sharing with the group a two kind of a two prong approach. It could be more than that, but at least two. One is education, and one is unrolling uh, legal structures. So boilerplate legal structures, examples of structures that municipalities could use, or a community could use, or a tribe could use. The language that actually ends up in court. So first. Uh, given the community an opportunity to realize on a really deep level what it what it takes for their for themselves and their region to be healthy and flourishing and the other is to what would legal protections actually look like getting together in a group 
going through the motions of making an official action and passing the legislation, whether it be at a township level or a county level or a municipal level, it could be a state level. If we had any states in the United States that are willing to take it on, it's certainly not Wisconsin. Um, you know, and, and getting that language to them so they can see what it looks like. And then let them run with it. And then support them if they get sued. So I feel like that, that has to be a major piece. And then have a discussion about how to enforce the laws once they're enacted. So it's all, I think it all kind of rolls out in the discussion over time. And I'm kind of hoping that we get like like nodes of activity around the lakes where these discussions can happen. And like it's kind of a no-brainer to have one in like Flint, Michigan or Chicago or Milwaukee or any of these big cities that are on the lakes. You'd think that would be a great place to have a discussion like that and roll things out. But because the project's so huge, we need to find people in those areas that want to take it on and run with it within their own communities because that's their community. They should be doing the work in their community, and we just support them while they're doing it. So that really leads to the last question. We have a couple minutes left, and um, the last question is, so for anybody who is in the Great Lakes region especially, but outside of it too, but especially inside the Great Lakes region, um, and they want to uh, participate in this or they want to find out more information about it, what should they do? You know, if there is the person listening in Milwaukee who thinks that they might want to start that process in their community, what what do they do? Well, there's a Great Lakes Right to Nature Coalition on Facebook, or there's me or the Earth Law Center that they can contact. My email is my name, all one word, at Gmail, so J-U-L-I-E-E-D-E-L-A-T-E-R-R-E at Gmail. So that's my personal email, and I can get them into the loop, or they can get a hold of the people at Earth Law Center. Unfortunately, I don't have their email right in front of me right now. Uh, great people over there. So that would be what they can do. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you want to say about this before we before we sign off? Um, I guess what I'd say to everybody out there, just love each other, take care of yourselves, your community, and the planet, because uh, we can't afford not to. Well, thank you so much for all that, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Julie Dulaterre. Um This is Resistance Radio, Derek Jensen from Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Thank you so much.